So, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's, so, uh, I, I complained bitterly when Tony produced the, the schedule that I was on at the same time as Andre Pang, knowing that everyone would want to go to his presentation, so I'm glad you guys are all here. Hopefully, hopefully you're expecting to um, your talk on push notifications. If not, just quietly sort of leave while I'm turning around looking at the slide or something. Um, so, my name's Mark. I'm um, um, here invited to speak from, um, as a sort of representing Sydney Cocoa Heads. So, for anyone who doesn't know, Cocoa Heads is a, a gl basically a global user group um, for um, not just Cocoa, but really Mac related programming or Apple related programming these days. Um, so, certainly if you're in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane, you should be getting along to your Cocoa Heads chapter every month. Um, if, um, and it's, you know, there, there's, there's a huge range of, um, you know, people who don't program at all, beginners, you know, expert programmers, so, you know, don't feel like there's any kind of barrier to entry. Um, you know, mostly it's someone doing a bit of a talk, then people talking a bit and then drinking beer. That's pretty much it, so um, I encourage you to get along to that. Um, a quick intro to me, so I, I have a um, software consultancy business and, and do various sort of software development, consulting, things like that. Um, and I've been doing, you know, Apple and, and Mac related things since my second computer. My first computer was a VIC-20, Commodore VIC-20. Anyone have a Commodore VIC-20? No, anyone Commodore 64? Good, I guess I get a few hands on it. Commodore 16, wow, with the built-in applications and the buttons. Cool. Anyway, so after that, I switched over to Apple stuff. Um, so, I've mentioned Coca Heads. All right, so a quick quick introduction to how we're going to progress, um, partly because it might, and this is why I ask people to keep questions till the end, because um, it might seem like a slightly odd order, but I think it's the best order to understand things. So, first I'm going to cover a quick high-level introduction to push notifications, the protocol, and whatnot. Um, then we're going to talk about the implementation on the device, so receiving notifications, and then we're going to talk about sending notifications. Um, it, it just makes it easier to, to, to sort of cover that way. So, push notifications, what are they for? Um, they're for small SMS style notifications. So, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone's played Word with, Words with Friends or Chess with Friends or something where you get a push notification with a, you know, it's your turn or some very small amount of information. Um, you know, and, and that's it's great for that. Um, you can use it for other things as well, but when it's small, you know, non-reliable pieces of information, um, you can set the app's numerical badge, so things like you know, unread message counts, you know, number of words with friends turns you have to do, things like that. So what are they not for? Um, they're not for delivering required application data for heaps of reasons. So first, 256 bytes maximum payload, that would have been fine for the Commodore 16. Um, but you're not going to be obviously transferring a significant amount of data with 256 bytes. Delivery isn't guaranteed, and in fact, um, in the case where someone's phone's off or whatever and you send multiple notifications, they will only receive the last message delivered. So it's almost guaranteed that you know, there will be messages that don't get through, not because it's unreliable or whatever, you know, partly just because of you know, that design. Um, so. Now we're going to talk about the actual sort of mechanics of how overflow of how, overview of how it works. So we've really got three parties to push notifications. We've got your server, we've got the device, and we've got Apple's um, APNS server, or I'm sure it's a server farm of lots of servers. Um, so there's there's two stages. There's the, the whole registration, setting it all up, and then there's you know sending and receiving notifications. So um, before any sending and receiving notification happens. Um, when a device first turns on um, or first gets network access, um, it's going to make a connection in the background to Apple's APNS server. And it's going to say, hi, I'm a, you know, a new iPhone, or this is the first time I've used push notifications. And um, you know, I've got a, a, here's a token that I just made up, and um, you know, here's my ad device identifier. It's not quite that simple, it's actually a certificate, but pretend it's the identifier. Apple does some stuff with that. It saves in the database, I guess. It encrypts it and sends back another token, which is, which is based on this information, but it's you know, some random string. Um, now, at that point, because the phone has, has said, you know, I, I want to receive push notifications from Words with Friends, my example for today, um, the Words with Friends server needs to know what that token is that the device has just gotten back from Apple 
so that it can send messages to you know this unique device, you know this user in this case. So um, the token's no use on the phone. The the phone app needs to get that to you know your server, so that you at the server end can use that for sending messages down. So this is kind of like a, a I guess a handshaking where you know the device is saying yeah I'm cool for this app to send me notifications and then gets back from Apple, okay, here's a token that the application can use to identify that. Um, so everything on the right here is Apple defined. I mean, that's just how it works. You know, it happens all in the background by, with Apple's code. Um, on the left is defined by you. You know, you're responsible for, once you've gotten that token from Apple, getting it somehow from the device to your server. So that's the, the, um, that part. So once you've done that, now we're just in the flow of you know, sending and receiving notifications. Um, so again, potentially the device has been off. Um, it turns on and it's going to connect to the Apple's server because the push notifications come down through a, a, a constant socket that the phone keeps open to the push servers. Um, so it connects, it's going to send through you know, its, its individual device token, not, not the one for your app, just its own. Um, you know, it's ID, it's certificate. Apple's going to check that in its database. Yeah, it decrypts, it validates, so, um, sends back a response. So that socket is then open the whole time your phone is running, uh, and it might disconnect. You know, you go into a tunnel and it'll re do this reconnection again. But basically, that, that socket's always open. Um, sometime later, you want to send a notification, and um, your server, all it knows about the device is there's this particular token. You know, and maybe you've tied that to a username or something. Um, and you want to send the payload. You want to send the actual notification. So at some time, you send that token and that payload to Apple's server. Again, Apple does some sort of validation on that, you know, with the token and also your certificate of the server. Um, make sure it's checked up. Make sure that, the, that, you know, that's been authorized. And then we'll send that payload to the device, you know, on, on your behalf. That's pretty much, pre pretty much how it works. And I mean, obviously, there's a few simplifications there, but really, it's not much more um, complex than that. So we're going we're to come back to this. So if it doesn't sort of gel in, you know, maybe with some code examples or whatever, it, it, it might. Excuse me. So, okay, so the notifications. I mentioned the payload in the last one. What, what does that look like? So for starters, it's a binary protocol, um, which, you know, Apple have done because on their, on their side, that that's going to scale a lot easier. Um, and you know, potentially you're talking about a lot of push notifications globally, but it means we have to be kind of careful because it's not, you know, it's not just a, a, a bit of text. It's it's something that you can get aligned incorrectly. So we need to be a bit careful. Um, and the Apple Docs aren't really that illuminating. I mean, on one hand, it's you know, this is the format, and so it's very simple. But then there's a few complexities that they they kind of gloss over. Like they don't mention anything about. Um, you know, the encoding of the, the payload. So, you know, it seems to be UTF-8, um, you know, but they, they never kind of mention that. Um, the 256 byte limit I mentioned applies to the payload. So when I say the payload, we're talking about this section here. So, um, you know, the, the, the whole packet you send to Apple can be slightly longer. Um, the um, device tokens are currently, yeah, so this is the device token here, the thing that you're storing on the server, currently 32 bits, uh, bytes rather, but they might change. And also what might change is, so we've got this command here. So we're, kind of, we're sending a command, um, you know, the token we want to send that command to and then the data. Um, there is only one command, command zero, which means sends a push notification. Um, you know, and Apple's given no hint to whether they'll use it for something else. I guess they might one day. Um, so you can see it's, kind of, it's fundamentally very simple. We're saying command zero would like to send a push notification. Uh, here's the device token we want to send it to. Um, and we want to send 34 bytes of data, and here it is. Now, this data format, we'll look at it a bit more in a second, but um, it's a combination of a structured data for the push notification, plus you can put random data in there that you want, which will get delivered to the app up to 256 bytes. All right, so here is the payload. Now, there's kind of two ways you can, you can structure the payload, or really there's, there's, the, there's the payload and then there's sort of an enhanced version. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a dictionary. It's in JSON format, if anyone knows what that is. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And so here's the three, well, they're not required, but the three simple keys. So first, we've got an alert. In the simple case, that can be a string. So that's, you know, 
It's your turn with the words of friends. Um, got a badge that's an integer, which is you know the the message counts that little badge you can put on the app, um, and a sound. Now the sounds obviously in two to six bytes, you're not downloading a sound file. What you're sending is a string which matches the name of a sound file in your application. So you kind of have to have decided in advance what the sounds possibly might be, and they're all bundled in the app. Um, so the alert's obviously the main thing, and like I said, that can be a string, obviously that's easy, uh, or it can be a dictionary with some more advanced options that we'll look at in a minute. Um, so, yeah, they're the, they're the two choices. So that alert dictionary, if you don't want to use just a standard string, you want to put in a dictionary, gives us a bunch of other options. Um, so because we've replaced the alert string with a dictionary, you need to be able to provide the alert string somehow. Um, so we've got this key body, which again, you can just provide a simple string. Um, now the other option for providing the alert is this um, uh, uh, lock key here, so localized key. Um, so kind of like with the sound file, there you're not sending the string, you're sending, okay, here's a key of how to look up the message I want to say in the localized strings file that's already in the application. So you might have, you know, let's say you had a simple string like, you know, you've got mail, well, you could have that, you've got mail in 10 languages in the localized strings file in your app and choose which one to use. Um, further to that, if you want to say, you know, you've got five messages, um, you know, you could have, you've got a placeholder messages and then that can be localized. But that's kind of weird because unless you're going to use digits for that five, you need that number to be localized anyway, right? You know, you've got Uno messages. Um, in which case, your server needs to know what language that user has. And in that case, you don't really need that anyway because you could just make the string in the right language at the server's end and send that straight through. So I, I honestly, apart from the very simple cases, I don't really know how that's particularly useful. The final thing, you notice I skipped the second one, this action lock key. So this is, this is interesting. So if you've seen a push notification, you know that um, usually it comes up, it says you've got a new turn, uh, cancel or you know play or cancel or view. So by default you get a cancel button and you get a view button and if the person taps view it'll launch your application. If they tap cancel then it doesn't. So this action lock key you can either change the string of that view button or you can say look I don't want a view button it's just informative they never need to launch the application all I want is an OK button. So you've got those choices there with that as well. And that um, yeah if you want to replace that string your only option there is um, a, a localized key, so that key that the key for the button already has to be in your app. It obviously has to be quite short. And uh, we're going to sort of we'll cover that in more detail. I'm just setting setting the framework here, so don't, if it's if I'm it's going over your head, I apologise, but we'll we'll be covering it a bit more later. Um, and the final thing we're going to cover in the overview is the feedback. So this is sort of a, t a parallel system. So what we've talked about so far is everything you need to know about sending messages um, in, in the high level. Now, there's a separate process called feedback where um, Apple will basically tell you, stop sending messages to this token uh, because they've either turned off push notifications or they've deleted the app from your phone. Um, now, this is interesting for two reasons. One is, as we can see here, Apple says they're going to monitor whether you honor these requests or not and if you don't, some unspecified bad thing will happen, like they'll stop you know, letting you push messages or something. Um, but it's also really interesting because it's kind of the only way that you have of getting feedback about someone deleting your app. Now you can have, um, you can potentially put things like you know, um, monitoring in your app to ping your server and you can see, but maybe they've just stopped using the app for a while, um, but they're not so frustrated with the app that they actually deleted it. Um, if you're sending them push notifications and they either turn off the notifications or delete the app, you kind of find out, right? Certainly you could build some rough stats. So that's, that's kind of interesting too. Um, now, a very interesting... Um, oh, no, no, I'll cover that later. Um, yeah, so it's, again, it's a binary format. You connect to Apple. They send you a, a kind of a set of dictionaries which gives you a device token and uh, uh, the time that you know, that, that happened. Um, yeah, and we're going we're gonna, to... There's some intricacies to do with this that we'll talk about later when we cover the code. So that's the end of the, the brief overview. So that, that's, that kind of is all there is to it. 
in terms of how, how it all works. Because you know, all you're doing is pushing simple bits of data, they're tapping OK, you've got feedback. I mean, that's, that's it. So conceptually, it's, it's, it's kind of easy. So now we're going to um, talk about the actual mechanics, and we'll see some code of how it all works on the, on the phone. And then we'll do the sending. But before we do any of that, we kind of have to do a few things at the start. So if you've done any iOS development, you know you have to sort of get a certificate, you set up an app ID, things like that. Um, we do that, we've got a few extra things. So for any given application, we need to um, generate that app and bundle ID, which we do through the developer portal. You know, you register the, the app name um, and get the bundle ID, which is, you know, com dot something. Um, in addition to that, oh, and, and as part of that, you, you get a provisioning profile. Now, you could always do that for, often you don't need to do that for a normal app. Um, but in the case of push notifications, the provisioning profile has to be tied to that app. You can't just use the generic in you know, a team provisioning profile. Um, and you also need a push certificate and a push private key, which you get in the same place that you have generated the, the, um, you know, the provisioning and the, and the app bundle. It generates it for you. You just have to download it. Um, there's, actually a, um, there's actually a wizard in the, the, you know, the web development portal which is pretty good. You basically go and say, I want to do a new app, and it'll take you through the steps. I oh, need to do this. You need to generate a, a certificate request in you know, Keychain. You have to upload it. There's quite a few steps, um, but the wizard basically takes you through, and at the end of it, you will have these four things. You know, you'll have the app and bundle ID. You'll have the certificate and key in your Keychain and Xcode, and you'll have the provisioning profile. And the trick is you need two sets of all of that because... Apple has a sandbox environment for developing push notifications, you know, separate of the production one, which is good, but your certificate for connecting to that is different. So it's sort of a bit more hassle than with normal app. You go through all this stuff twice. Um, so like, and, and I forget it every time. So thank goodness that the wizard actually is pretty easy because you forget. You, know, it's not, you don't do it that often. Um, all right. So if you remember the... Um, that first diagram, let's actually, I'll just quickly jump back to it. Um, I think it's slide five. All right. So we need to do this kind of funny registration thing, yeah? So um, the app will pop up, it's the alert that you've probably seen. Would you like this app to send you push notifications? You say yes. Um, it communicates with Apple, gets a token. We send the token to the, the server. Okay, so that's what we're going to do right, right now. Or well, you're going to see some code and paste it in that does that right now. Um, the first part is very simple. Um, in, well, wherever you want, but usually in the application did finish launching method, you put this method call. Um, it runs on the UI application object, register for remote notification types, and you can say whether you want to receive you know, alerts and or sounds and or badges. That's all you have to do. You don't have to have a special if block or anything, you just run this every time your app runs. Um, and at that point, if the, that hasn't already been done, um, that's when they'll see the alert saying, uh, you know, would you like to let this app send you push notifications? So that's useful if maybe you don't want to do it right at the start. You know, maybe you've got an app where for some frustrating reason you have to put some legal terms they agree to and, you know, you can do this after. But usually you just sort of stick it in application, didn't finish launching. And if they have either accepted or denied it, then you can still safely call this method. It's not going to pop up the alert anymore. But it is going to do that round trip with Apple and to your server, um, so which is good because you know if you've lost a token or something, then it'll, it'll be refreshed. There's, um, so yeah, you, you just do that every time. So that's great. So, this, so we've done that first part, but now, but now how do we get actually get the token right? So um, so we need to the token comes back to your um, UI application um, delegate as a callback method uh, message. And so you get, um, you can get one of two. You can get an error. The only time I've ever seen the error is in the simulator. But so because of that, you need to handle it because obviously you're going to be doing stuff in the simulator. So that's easy. Um, but the actual case is this first message here. Application did register for notification with device token. So there's, there's our token. Right, we've got an NS data of a little chunk of data. Um, from back from Apple, which happens pretty quickly, but obviously it's you know, some some small time after they've tapped the button. Um, so that's great. So uh, you know, in this example, I've saved it to a, a property on the delegate. 
um, but we need to get it to our server. So, you know, an easy, obviously that's going to be over HTTP or something like that. Um, and you probably want to do that in the background because, you know, you don't want to put up a little spinner saying, waiting for token from Apple. Okay, we've got it now uploading to the server. So, um, we run a, a selector in the background to do that, which is, is, here's an example. I mean, you can do it however, however you want, but effectively you're doing something like you have to convert the, um, well, you have to upload this binary chunk of data to your server, so you probably want to convert it to a text string cause just because that makes it easy, it's easier and it's so small. And also, the server APIs we're going to look at all require a hex encoded string, so you might as well do that here. Um, so there's a funky little bit of code here which I got off Nathan DeVries in Sydney. I should credit him. Um, and in my case here, literally all it's doing is it's constructing a URL with a query string, uh, you know, token hex equals the string. Now, you might need to also upload the, you know, someone's username or whatever, but that's effectively all you're doing. You want to get this, this chunk of data in hex string format into your server so that you can then send the messages to it. You know, there's, there's any number of ways that you can do that. So we've done that in that diagram. We've, we've covered that whole first interaction diagram. We've you know, got the token from Apple. We've got it back to the device. We've got it to our server. We're now ready to start sending and receiving notifications. So like I said, we're going to cover receiving notifications first. Um, so there's two, well, there's a couple of cases. Fundamentally, there's two cases. Your app is running or it's not running at the time that the notification comes in. So the simplest case is your, your app isn't running, or the first case. Um, you know, the app's not running on the phone, and they get an alert, so they get the little, you know, dialogue pop-up. You know, so you've got a new message. Now, if the user taps cancel at that point, nothing happens. Your app doesn't get launched, no messages get called, nothing. So that's an easy case. If they tap view, your app is launched, um, but slightly differently to normal. So... Um, the, you need to implement a, a method message, which I think in the, in the new templates in Xcode is actually the standard now. It used to be that they gave you just the application did finish launching. Um, but actually what you want to implement is this application did finish launching with options. Now normally if someone just taps your app, that options dictionary is, is, is nil, it's empty. Um, but in the case that they've, it's been launched because someone tapped view on a push notification, um, they, it'll, the launch options has a dictionary, and we can see an example of this dictionary here. It's got, um, it'll have a single key UI application launch options remote notification key. These enums are starting to get quite long. Um, and this um, dictionary here is, is you'll recognize the keys. These are exactly what um, we sent in the payload to Apple. Um, so we will have sent, you know, an alert string, potentially a badge, potentially a sound. And so you get all of that. Now, you, often you don't care, you know, because let's say it was a mail app. All you care about is that it's been launched and you're going to go and check for the new messages anyway. Um, but, you know, you, you, you might care. Um, and and there's, there's sort of good reasons too we'll cover in a minute. So that's if your app wasn't running. Um, now, I'm just confused about time because we didn't start it on an hour. I have to do a mental calculation to see how we're going. All right. Um, okay, now if your app is already running, ignore the background thing for the minute. Um, so if your app's running, they're using your app, and a push notification comes in. It's also quite simple. Um, they don't, the, the OS doesn't present, you know, a, a sort of a, a SMS-style alert dialogue at all. All it does is silently, in the run loop, call, on your um, application delegate, call this message. Application did receive remote notification, and again, the dictionary will, should look pretty similar. So, again, if, if you're like in a mail app, um, you probably don't care what's in the dictionary, but it might, for instance, trigger you to maybe you normally only check for messages or turns or whatever every minute. Well, you may as well check right now because you, know you know that something's just coming to the server, so you can, you can do that. Um, you know, you might, might want to use some of the data in here. And so, Something you'll see here is we've got a little, we've got something extra here. In the dictionary, we've got this APS dictionary, which is what we've seen a few times. You know, we're sending an alert, which could have been just a string. In this case, it's the dictionary. Uh, we might have a badge, we might have a sound. But outside of that APS dictionary, um, you can send whatever you want. You can put just random stuff in that JSON um, dictionary up to 256 bytes. 
So, um, you know, that might be useful for something like, um, you let, okay, let's say it's a chess game. And so you've notified, hey, it's your turn to play with John. Um, he's kicking your ass, something like that, you know. Um, so at that point, you can start up saying, oh, checking for new turns. Well, you might just want to be a little bit friendly. You could say, oh, downloading your next turn with John or something like that, you know. So you can kind of use it, but um, you can really only use it for advisory data because it's, you know, non-reliable and, and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, the key thing is that the format is whatever you want. Outside that APS dictionary, you can jam in any random, random data. Um, so the subtle point for iOS 4 and later is your app could be in the background. So it's suspended, or maybe it's just running, doing some audio stuff, but fundamentally the main app is suspended. Um, but it's not, it's not not running. So, when the user, so, so in that case, the, the iPhone will... Show, or the device will show the, the alert like normal, just like as if your app wasn't running. If the user taps cancel, again, nothing happens. If they tap view, your app will come to the foreground, but of course it hasn't just launched. So that application did finish the launching method, doesn't get the call. So they had to invent something new. So basically, um, it's kind of like your app was running. If, if the, the difference is, is that the, the, the dialogue will be presented, but if the user does tap view, the, your app will come to the foreground, and then as soon as your app is finished coming to the foreground, this same, this same message will be sent, just as if your app was in the foreground the whole time. So the subtle difference is the timing's a bit different. Um, if your app is already running, you know, the instant that the message comes in, that message will be called. Um, in the case that it's in the background, potentially it's sometime later till they tap view and then it comes to the foreground and whatnot. But, um, now, of course, if you, if you choose to configure the app so it doesn't run in the background, then you don't have to worry about that. Also... Like I said, because in many cases all you're doing is really using this as a hint to maybe go and check for new data on the net, um, you know, you can sort of ignore a lot of that, that little complexity. Um, yeah. Oh, and yeah, there is one other slight complexity. So if you've configured the alert so that you only get the OK button and not the view, um, you can also have this odd circumstance where your app is running in the background, but because they tap the OK or, or they tap the cancel, then this message never gets called. And also remember that they may have had multiple alerts and they're only going to get the last one. So um, that usually doesn't matter. All right, we've, I promised we'd set a cracking pace. Um, so we're going to take a little mental break uh, because we've, we've now covered everything sort of on the hypothetical level and we've covered everything about receiving messages. I mean, there's no more APIs, there's no extra detail. Um, that's it. You know, that, that's literally all there is to it. You know, how you use them in your app is, is another thing, but that's, that's all there is to the APIs and whatnot. So, um, now we're going to talk about sending notifications. So, um, and now we are actually doing pretty well for time, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back on what I said and, and um, maybe see if anyone's got any questions before we Shift our brain into the next gear. Has, uh, does anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? You know, so if no one asks questions, it's always one of two things. Either it was so clear, it was like, yeah, yeah, we know exactly what you're talking about. Or we've got no frigging idea, so we can't even think, formulate a question to ask. Um, so both of those extremes are usually unlikely. So, so probably someone has a question, but if not, we can, we can push on. No? Okay, I'm just going to believe that it's the, the former of those two things. Um, okay, sending notifications. All right, so um, remember we did the preparation right at, right at the outset, right? You know, we got our certificate, we got our, our key. Um, so we need that certificate and private key on the server because we're going to use that when we communicate with Apple. Um, so they're sitting in your keychain on your Mac. As, as part of the, the sort of upload and download process. Um, it's a little bit annoying because the Keychain Access app, when it exports a, a, a key and certificate pair, uses this P12 format that, that I don't know, nothing else I've ever seen of, uh, uses. So you almost always want it in, in this um, sort of text archive PEM format. Um, fortunately, there's a simple OpenSSL command line which will do all the conversion for you. So you export it from the Keychain Access app and then you use some combination of, of the OpenSSL command to convert it. So um, you can see the first line here where um, taking the P12 file and outputting a certificate 
PEM file, that's easy. The second line is taking the same file and outputting the private key. Now that particular command is going to, in, is going to require you to enter a password, so it's an encrypted private key. Um, which on, a, on a, like a laptop or something is what you always want, but on a server, um, I mean, if you can work out to use a, a, an encrypted private key, uh, you know, secured with a password, that's great. But usually you're going to have to put that password on a config file or code or something anyway. So once someone's compromised your server, they've got the password and the key, and you've just made more work for yourself. So often um, you just want a, a, you know, a no password. Um, and so that's what this last line does. It basically decrypts the, the private key and, and takes the, the password out. Um, so if you did want to use a password, I mean, how you need to do it or how you can do it is use something like an escrow. So you might have a, you know, so you might have one, let's say we've got a farm of servers. You might have one, you know, super secure server that keeps the passwords and these other serv servers just sort of request the password from that so it's only in RAM, not on disk, things like that. But that's obviously a lot of work. Um, so, okay, so that's our, that's our, you know, preparation. So... High-level overview of how you send the notification in, you know, our server code. We create a TLS connection. So TLS, Transport Layer Security, is basically just the next version of SSL. Um, so uh, we're create, effectively creating, you know, an encrypted tunnel with Apple. Um, you know, we're constructing one or more of those binary notification packets we talked about. And then we're going to send that down the socket and, you know, repeat. Um, so let's do that. So we're going to cover um, two fundamentally different ways to do it using um, Perl, Python, and Ruby. We're going to cover the Perl module first for two reasons, um, probably primarily because I wrote this module. Um, so A, I understand it, and um, you know, B, it's, it's always good to self-promote. Um, but also it's the, it's, it's the simpler, more direct approach. Uh, we literally got a piece of code which is going to itself directly connect to the Apple servers. Um, so, yeah, so we're using Perl. I mean, there's a number of ways to do it, but you want something that's fast because you're probably going to be sending a lot of messages. Um, you know, you need something that's going to be good at handling, making it easy to handle binary formats and, and the, the encryption. And you, whatever, whatever language you're using, you probably need a relatively modern version because you want, um, you know, stable UTF-8 handling unless you're sending pure ASCII. Um, uh, other modules do this as well, but this module will automatically limit your payload to 56 bytes, which is important because if you send a malformed packet, which can include being over 256 bytes, Apple will sort of some slight time later notice that you're out of alignment and drop your connection, but you kind of don't know when. So you may have thought you sent some other messages and, and, and you didn't, and there's not really any feedback from Apple on that. Um, so that does that for you. Um, like with Perl all Perl modules, it's super easy to install. You do that. Um, and just a quick note, if you're going to sort of go and try and demo some of this stuff yourself, either the Perl or the Python or the Ruby stuff, my recommendation always is don't install modules on the system installations. And especially so with Perl because there's, there's parts of Xcode that will use Perl scripts. So, for instance, the Symbolicate um, thing uh, is a Perl script. And so if you kind of break your system Perl installation by upgrading some module that's not backwards compatible or something, then... You know, things that you expect to work might stop. So I always use Mac ports to install my own version of, you know, Perl or Python or whatever, and there's other ways to do that, but that's just my recommendation. Okay, so um, now you'll notice that the, the name of the class here is NetAPNS Persistent, and, and this bit's important because the Apple specs require you to maintain a persistent connection to the server. If you send a million um, uh, push notifications by opening a socket, sending the notification, closing the socket and doing it again, Apple will consider your creating a denial of service attack and, and shut down your certificate. And, prevent, and presumably, you know, if you do that a couple of times, they're going to shut down your whole account. So, um, you know, if you're just sending, if it's a hobby thing, you're sending a couple of messages, they're not going to care. But, um, you know, the docs specifically state that you need a persistent connection. Um, so, uh, you know, we make an object... Um, like I said, there's a sandbox or a production environment, so we need to say which one of those we're going to do. Um, we need to provide the certificate and the key and potentially a key password. Um, and so now we've got a connection to Apple, um, and we can, we can send multiple messages on this, on this object. But because we've specified a certificate, this connection is, un is purely for a single app. You know, if you've got two apps, you can't send messages push messages down the same socket because this certificate is just for your app. And those tokens 
are uniquely tied to that certificate and that app, if that makes sense. And therefore, and therefore also either to production or, or the sandbox. Okay, so we've got that object. Um, we've got our list of, of notifications. Um, we need to... Um, um, now, you could just send, again, here, you could queue one and then send it, but then you're going to run into things like, you know, the Nagel algorithm that's going to slow you down or whatever. So, um, ideally, if you've got, you know, a million notifications, you're probably going to push them down the socket in batches of, I don't know, a thousand or something. But, um, so, when we queue the notification, we've got this here is just a shortened version of that token. It's going to be some hex string like this. Um, and then we've got a hash or a dictionary, which is, again, we've, we've seen this before, right? We've got the alert, which here, in this case, is a string with, a, with, an, with an inline UTF-8 character. Um, we're sending a sound, so default is a special case string. That doesn't have to be in your app. That'll just play whatever is the, you know, the user-selected alert sound on your iPhone. Um, and we may or may not want to send a badge, which obviously has to be an integer. Um, we can queue multiple things, and then we say send queue, and that's it. There's no, there's no return value because Apple doesn't send any feedback. Um, I mean, the only feedback you can get is you can, you can encase this in, a, in an eval in Perl to catch an exception because an exception will be raised eventually if the socket is dropped. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of all, all there is. So that's, that's pretty easy, right? Um, um, now, the thing, of course, here is that, you know, you need some sort of loop, you know, because this is a persistent object, obviously you're not going to be holding this in a web server, um, you know, so you, you're going to have to kind of build some, some, sort, of, um, some sort of system around that. Um, did I, yeah, I covered all of that. Okay, so we showed a UTF-8 example. Um, I had to play around with this for a while to get it to work, so here's an example just to prove that it does work. Um, you know, anything that is, the, the fonts on the, on, the, on the iPhone seem to have, have, have an entire UTF-8 set. So, um, you know, basically anything that's in the UTF-8 spec seems to be pretty well supported, um, which is good. I had a segue about maybe switching over to look at something, so I'm just going to check. Do anyone know what time this session exactly is supposed to finish? Um, I'm 15 past the hour, okay, all right, well, we don't have time. Yeah, you're right, okay. We don't have time for that segue, so that's fine. We might. Um, okay, so remember, remember there, was, there was about getting feedback, right? So again, there's a, there's a part of this module to get feedback. Getting feedback is actually even easier because um, all you do is you connect, and as soon as the socket's open, Apple's just going to sort of stream down to you um, the feedback data, and then you close it. Now, like I said, they said that they're going to check whether you check it, but they don't say how often or anything. Um, so certainly it's the case that they don't expect you to respond, you know, within sort of a minute or something. So probably something like once a day, a cron job or something, to download the data and make changes in your database is probably, probably adequate. Um, we, connect, we connect in the same way, certificate, key, particular password. Um, now, there's a very, very interesting um, thing here which took me a while to figure out, so you, you're saving yourself some time. Um, if the device has no active push apps, it doesn't maintain that push socket to Apple to save power. So when that's the case, the phone will never reject. So let's say you were the only push notification app and they delete it or turn off push. They've now not got that socket. So when you send them a push notification, it never gets to the phone. Therefore, the phone never rejects it. Therefore, Apple never sends you any feedback. So that's fine because you just ignore it. You just keep sending them and Apple doesn't care because they haven't told you to stop. But that's important because since the sandbox is a different socket, when you try and test this stuff, if you've only got one app and then you delete it, you're never going to get the feedback. So if you want to test your feedback code, you need a second development push app on your phone that's active so that the phone keeps the socket open. Right, so just make up a dummy app that does nothing except have a certificate and say requires push notifications and leave that installed on your phone so that it maintains that socket and you get the feedback. Okay, so hopefully it saves someone some time. Um, okay, and what does that look like? Um, yeah, feedback only if there is any. Now, um, remember it had the time and the token. So time t is a, an integer which is a Unix epoch, so rel relative to January 1st, 1970. Um, now, you can and probably will get duplicate tokens because you get a, a feedback for each time that you've sent a notification that was rejected. 
So first of all, you can get duplicates and so filter that out. The other thing that's important is, is why is the time there? Well, why the time's there is because remember, you're not checking this in real time. So potentially someone might delete your app in the morning and then reinstall it in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, um, if it's the same, if they haven't reinstalled their OS, and they're running the same app and requesting notifications, they get exactly the same token. So at midnight, let's say you run this, you might get a saying, okay, at 9 a.m. they requested you to stop sending push notifications. So you need to know in your database that, yeah, but in two o'clock in the afternoon, they reinstalled my app and asked to receive push notifications. So because if you don't do that time check, then you might be stopping sending them to someone who thought that they re-enabled it. Yeah, so, you yeah, know, that's... That's the only trick there. Um, okay, so that's, we'll just have another slightly quick mental break because kind of this could be the end of the presentation. In fact, I have given this presentation before slightly differently and that was the end of the presentation. Um, so both hypothetically and in practice, now you know everything you need to know about sending and receiving messages and that's, you know, if it seems simple, it's because it is. The, the, tr the difficulty is only in little intricacies like sockets and things like that, which if you're using a library, it's taking care of it for you, and you're probably only going to have to be stuffing around with things like, you know, if you get your UTF-8 encoding wrong or something like that. Um, so um, I said that we're going to be covering Perl, Python, Ruby. We're kind of really only covering two things. We're covering um, that Perl module, which is the direct approach. You're going to have to write your own run loop or something. Um, and now we're going to be covering, uh, it's actually a Python server, which um, you can kind of use as a proxy and you can connect to it using Python or Ruby or many other languages to sort of send on your behalf. Um, but firstly, who can tell me what's wrong with this slide? Was it? Sorry? No. So uh, if anyone was in, um, in Chris Neugebauer's talk, they would know that um, Python isn't named after Python, the snake. Named after Monty Python. So it's just an excuse to put the Monty Python foot in there. Okay, so PyIPNS is that server that I, I just mentioned. So you can see in this diagram, from, which I ripped from this site, fundamentally how it works. Um, in the example we just spoke about, we had our back end that we'd written and it communicated directly with the Apple servers, which communicates with the device. Yeah? Um, but so First of all, you have to write your back end, and secondly, if you've got a web server, you need to write a separate back end because you need the, 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 um, you know, the persistent connections. Fourthly, let's say, I don't know, you're Fairfax. You've got a bunch of apps that all have push notifications. You've got so many users, you need a farm of servers, but then you need a farm of servers per application, and it gets, gets tough. So PyIPNS server, you can run this on multiple machines, and each instance can handle, multi can handle as many different apps as you want. So all you need is enough servers to cover your volume and how that volume is distributed between your different apps doesn't matter. Now, having said that, very few people are actually going to need a farm because the, the binary protocol is so tiny and efficient that you, know, you can push a fire hose of, of notifications through one machine. Um, but anyway, the option's there. So the server itself is written in Python, but, we, but you, you kind of don't need to care if you don't want to. It's, pretty, it's, it's very stable. Um, so there's a native Python API, obviously. There's a native Ruby API they provide for you. But how this interaction works between your backend and PyIPNS is XML RPC over HTTP. So even if you wanted to, like, I don't know, do push notifications in .NET or something, I mean, everything has super easy access to XML RPC. Um, a side effect of that is you want to run this thing behind a firewall um, because, you know, otherwise someone could be using your, your infrastructure to send their notifications. Um, so installing and running is really easy. Uh, again, you know, you probably don't want to use your system Python. Um, but if you did, that'd be fine because Python 2.6 is the, the, probably the main version people run this on, which is what you get with Snow Leopard. Um, if you do use a Mac ports one or some other install, just be careful that you're using the easy install for the right version and, and whatnot. Um, so Twisted is a, is a Python um, framework that's, that's good for building um, a persistent backend servers. Um, and so uh, we're basically saying is a twisted web server, which is a command line tool there, you know, which class we're using, which has been installed, and what port we're going to run on. There's a tiny simplification because you obviously don't want to run this as root, but you do have to run it once as root to set up some caches, and there's a few other tricks and things. But check their website. Fundamentally, this is what you're doing. You're installing it and running it. Certainly, once you've got it up and running, all you do is run this command line to run the server. 
Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that, yeah. Um, okay, so we've run that command line. We've got the server running in the background. We've got some way to restart it if it crashes. Um, so how do we communicate with it? So because that's the back-end server and that's running persistently, I mean, we might be running from a script because we do, I don't know, batch notification or something, but you might also want to send a notification response to, say, a, a web hit, a web page hit or something, um, which is fine because, because in our code, we're not maintaining any sockets or anything. Yeah? We're making a tiny, very quick XML RPC call to the, the Twisted server, which is probably running on the same box. So, um, uh, yeah, we import the, the modules that we need. Um, we, um, so there's, there's kind of these three stages to using um, the, the PyIPNS. Configuration, provision, and notification. So configuration is you're just configura configuring your class to say, you know, here's, here's the URL of how you access the PyIPNS server. So that's pretty obvious. You do, you do that once, you know, for an entire process. Now, provisioning is interesting. So we can see here we've got um, what's called the app ID, which I've done the AUC test app. Um, we need to provide the certificate, which I've just pulled out from an environment key. Um, and we say whether we want the sandbox or not. Um, now, interestingly, you'll see there's only a certificate here, not a certificate in the key. So the PEM format is a text file that has sort of a begin and end and then some chunk of hex data in. And you can have the certificate and the key in one file. Now, if you've got them in two files, like I showed you before, you literally just cat them together. So that's, that's all that is there. Um, now, what this app ID here is, I mean, it's just a string, but that's how PyAPNS can handle push notifications on behalf of multiple apps. So that's how we're saying to Py, the PyAPNS server, hey, if you ever get anyone saying, please push a notification to this AUC test app, um, here's the certificate to use for that. So you kind of only need to do this once for each of your app IDs. Um, but it also doesn't matter if you do it multiple times as long as you're providing the same certificate. So whatever works for you. So you've done that, and then you can forget about it. Now, whenever you want to push a notification from um, you know, that process to that PyAPNS, we just call this function notify you know, AUC test app. Um, you know, here's the device token hex string. And again, here's our dictionary with exactly the same keys that, that we've seen before. Um, now, there can also be an optional callback. So this, this call here will, um, will uh, uh, you know, just send the XML RPC. Potentially, there's a few circumstances that PyAPNS could report back an error. Um, and so there's an optional callback. More likely, the callback is interesting if you're sending a million messages and you just want to know when it's finished. Um, so you can provide a callback option. That's, that, that, that's all it is, because you're not, you're not doing any of the any of the funky stuff with Apple. So in Ruby, it's almost exactly the same. Um, because, uh, yeah, so we import the modules. Um, we do the configuration, slightly different in the Ruby client. You say the host and the port, not a single URL. Um, but here, we're doing the same thing. We're saying, OK, I want to provision this app ID. Here's the certificate environment. For some reason, the timeout value is required, where it's optional in the Python API. Um, and then again, whenever we want, we call the notify method. Now, you can see, and actually, this is an option in Python as well. I'm, provi I'm not providing a single token notification. I'm providing an array of tokens and an array of notifications. In this case, just, just one. Um, so you can, you can bulk send a load that way. You just have, you know, uh, you can have 100 tokens, and you have the 100 notifications that correspond to those tokens. Um, and You've got the same callback option, which because it's Ruby, you can provide a, a trailing block, which is nice. Now, the other reason why um, I've shown the array format here is, and there's this funky um, enable nil parser thing up the top, is that in the current um, gem on, on gem cutter, there's actually a bug in it if you're using greater than Ruby 186. That means you can only use the, the array version, and you have to do that. So if you get the Git version or, 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 or whatever, you don't have to do that. But anyway, that's a, that's a little, little point there. Um, so apart from a few um, sort of you know, semantic differences, it's exactly the same as calling from Python. And in fact, this is, this is exactly how the XML RPC um, interface works. So if you wanted to you know, make raw XML RPC requests from, from I don't know, here, .NET or something, that it's, you're doing the same process using the same keys. It's, it's very, very easy. 
Um, so, and as I promised, we're finished in time for some questions. Um, there's a list of resources which, you know, don't, don't write them down because the slides, uh, according to Tony, will be on the site by um, tomorrow or something like that. Um, and so that is everything you need to know about push notifications in under an hour.